he too had answered the female's call for a mate. Now he advanced slowly into the clearing, head down, watching Kavik. He went straight to the female, and they sniffed noses. Then the female turned, trotted off a few feet, and sat down, leaving Kavik and the male wolf facing each other. This new wolf was almost as big as Kavik, and several years older. His coat was thick and coarse and almost black. He stood, stiff-legged, head lowered. His manner said plainly he meant to fight for the favor of the sleek female. Kavik's first impulse was to run away, as he'd run from the dogs in Copper City, and as he'd tried to run the day Mr. Hunter walked him down the block near his home. But the sight of the sleek young female sitting on her haunches, lips lifted in a grin as she looked at first one, then the other of them, held him in a grip as strong as life itself. Except for the short time he'd been with the boy, most of Kavik's life had been spent in harness, training for a race or staked to a ten-foot pain. The spirit of the mating season had touched him only briefly and from afar. Tonight, for the first time, it was near and so powerful it overwhelmed all fear and reason. As he watched the wolf approach, ears laid back, lips beginning to lift, Kavik knew what was coming. He and the black wolf must fight to the death for the favor of the young female. And she, remaining completely aloof, would go with the victor. The wolf in Kavik accepted this, but the domestic dog in him, bent to man's will for thousands of years, hesitated. It was almost his undoing. The attack came so suddenly it bowled Kavik completely off his feet and the wolf's teeth were at his throat. The battle might have ended there, but as the wolf struck for the throat, his teeth clamped down on Kavik's studded collar instead. The next instant, Kavik reared up with a snarl of rage and threw the wolf off. Then he was fighting with a savagery he had never known before. The wolf was an experienced fighter. He knew all the tricks, the speed of attack and wiles of retreat, and how to defend, and how to feint and strike and get away. And his incentive to win was as great as Kavik's. Kavik was bigger and stronger, but he was not so quick, and he had never fought a wolf before. The dogs he had met were slow and plodding in comparison to this wolf. Again and again, he tried to close with the wolf and sink his teeth in the soft flesh of his throat. But whenever Kavik struck, he was always met by the wolf's clashing fangs. Soon, both their mouths and lips were cut and bleeding. No matter how he tried, Kavik could not penetrate the wolf's lightning-quick guard. He enveloped the wolf in a whirlwind of rushes as he tried to hurl his greater weight against the animal and bowl him over and expose his throat. But the wolf always avoided him, danced away, then back to slash the dog's shoulders and neck and side of his face with razor-sharp teeth. The wolf remained almost untouched, while Kavik's blood streamed from numerous cuts. He was beginning to tire badly. All this time, the female sat on her haunches at the edge of the timber and smiled. This was not tragedy to her, but fulfillment. It was the way of life and love in the wild. As Kavik tired and began to pant hard, the wolf took to rushing. He kept the dog turning and twisting wildly to protect his feet and throat from those slashing fangs. Once those teeth closed on the leg or reached Kavik's or reached his throat, Kavik knew he would be finished. But Kavik possessed a quality the wolf did not. He could fight in ways other than pure instinct. As the lead dog for a sled team, he had been taught to think, to reason. In a burst of enthusiasm, Charlie One-Eye had once admitted, When the race starts, it's all Kavik's. I'd just run along to encourage him. And it was true. 
As the leader, Kavak had been responsible for keeping the team strung out and working hard. He set the pace. He'd had to know when to swing wide to clear an obstacle that could wreck the sled or avoid rotting ice that would break through and plunge them to their deaths. He'd had to be ever alert for trouble on the trail and ready to adjust quickly to an emergency. He was adjusting now from force of habit. In his desperation, he no longer fought with wolfish instinct. He was fighting with his head. He rushed jaws low to the snow and at the last instant swept into a snap at the wolf's front legs. Twice he did this, and each time the wolf danced aside. The third time he rushed, fainted low, and as the wolf leaped aside, Kavik whirled on his hind legs and lunged after him so quickly he caught the wolf just as he had struck the ground with all four feet bunched. For the first time, Kavik's driving shoulder smashed into the lighter animal and threw him back on his haunches. Then Kavik was on him, and his big jaws found the throat. The wolf fought madly to free himself, but it was useless. Kavik was merciless. He bore the wolf to the ground. His teeth drove deep for the jugular and found it. He held on for several minutes, even after the wolf had ceased to struggle. Finally, he let go and looked across his fallen foe to the female. She sat still. She sat. She still sat in the snow, watching. His head came up. His sharp ears shot forward, and he looked at her with steady yellow eyes. He had the dignity of a king and the bearing of a champion. Once again, it was a throwback to an arctic wolf father. He was Kavik, the wolf dog. Kavik stalked across to the female, and they sniffed noses. She licked the wounds on his face and neck. Then she trotted into the darkness of the timber, where she stopped and looked back, waiting for him. Kavik hesitated. This was not the direction he wanted to go. The female returned to him. She licked his face again and whined pleadingly. Once more, she trotted into the timber and stopped to wait. Kavik followed to the edge of the trees and halted. He turned his head to the north and stood utterly still, as if listening for some far-off sound. The female whined again, and he looked back at her. The desire that had driven him to answer her call and to fight to the death for her was all-consuming. Havoc went to her, and she touched his face gently with her muzzle. They trotted into the gloom together, traveling not north now, but due east. He was answering the age-old call of his kind, with the female at his side. Havoc ran through the vastness of land and the magic of the night.